anyway, I titled this Satan, the Great Magician, right? Um, and and you know what what I we call them magicians, don't we? You know, everybody knows what a magician is, right? They'll hold a coin in front of you, right? And then they'll you'll see them put it in their other hand, right? And then they open their hand and it's gone. And people call that magic. And the reality is, is that's that's not magic. Mm-hmm. It is it is misdirection. It is it is making you deceiving your mind or your eyes to look one way while something's happening in the other direction. Now let me let's read the context. He says. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God and Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. He says the earth also was corrupt before God. And the earth was filled with violence. So the earth was corrupt. It's filled with violence, right? And God looked upon the earth and behold, it was corrupt. So... Do you see any similarities between Noah's time and the time we're living? It's filled with violence and it's corrupt. Mm -hmm. Okay. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. Now look at this. Look at that that term. Corrupted his what? His way. So there's a way, right? Right. And for some reason, the earth, just like in the days of Noah, we're living in those days too now. He says, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes. And that's what we're going to see is when you when you when you look at when you go to a magic show, right? And the guy holds a card up and then he turns it around and it's another card or it disappears, right? That card did not vanish in clean just air. He, what he was doing was he was playing a trick on you. Let's look. I want to, I'm going to read a story to you and I'll show you what I mean. Okay. So we know the story of Balak and Balaam, the children of Israel had come up out of Egypt and they were, they were there and Balak uh, was worried about them coming down and, and, um, and taking the land. And so Balak is going to call or go to visit Balaam, who is a prophet of God. Matter of fact, if you get to the scripture, there's a lot of there's a lot of prophet. There's a lot of prophecies that Balaam gave. Balaam gave uh, the prophecy about the, the there's going to be a scepter come out of Israel. Right? He gave a lot of these prophecies. So Balaam was a prophet of God, and he says Balak sent yet again princes, more and more honorable than they. And they came to Balaam and said to him, Thus saith Balak, the son of Zippor. So he, these prophets, Balak had sent these, pro, uh, these men to Balaam, and they offered him all kind of honor and money and riches, and, and he kept telling them, if, if, Listen, I can't take it. Uh, you know, God's spoken his word, and I'm going to abide by God's word. But Balak didn't give up. He came again. And these men come to Balaam and said, Thus saith Balak, the son of Zippor, Let nothing, I pray thee, hinder thee from coming unto me, for I will, I'm going to do some things for you, Balaam. I'm going to promote you unto very great honor, right? And I will do whatsoever thou sayest unto me. Come, therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people. And Balaam answered and said unto the servants of Balak, If Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord, my God. Now that that sounds really, really good, right? That should be the attitude of every believer. I can't do less or more. Now, therefore, I pray you, tarry ye also here this night. So he's telling all these men, y'all stay here. I'm going to go talk to God again. I mean, God's already told him how many times, right? But I'm going to talk to God one more time that I may know what the Lord will say unto me more. And look what it says. God came unto Balaam. So God is going to directly speak to Balaam at night. And this is what he says to him. Look at that word. If 
the men come to call thee, then you can rise up and do what? Go with them. But yet the word which I shall say unto thee, that, that shall that do, thou do. Now, and Balaam rose up, right? He said, rise up and go with them, right? So he rose up in the morning and sat on his ass, and he went with them. Now, what's the problem? The, the problem is, he says, if the men come to call thee. So something in Balaam's heart, right, I had already taken over that, whether those men, men came or they didn't come, guess what? He was gone. He was gone. And that's the way that we as believers are. We, we, we've already determined what way we're going to go without, and sometimes with, God telling us, right? Because it's not like God didn't tell him. God did come unto him, but he heard. This is not what he heard. He didn't hear this if. He just heard, whoops. He didn't hear the if. He just heard what? Rise up and go with them. So he rose up and went with them, right? right? And look what it says. And God's anger was kindled because he what? Right. Because the men didn't come and get him. Right. And the angel of the Lord stood in what? Look at that term. Mm -hmm. The way. So the path he's going down, the way he's going, because he wasn't supposed to go that way, was he? No. He should, he should still be sleeping. Right. So he said the way for the, the, the angel stood in the way for an adversary against him because the Lord was angry with him and the Lord didn't want him going. Now he was riding upon his ass and uh, his two servants were with him and the ass saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way and his sword drawn in his hand and the ass turned aside out of the way. So the way that Balaam's going, the way he wants to go with these men, right? His ass is going is trying to do something, not go that way. Mm -hmm. Because the ass knows something. The donkey knows something, right? Right. That Balaam doesn't know. So it goes on, he says, but the angel of the Lord stood in a path or the way of the vineyards. And a wall being on this side and a wall on that side. And when the ass saw the angel, she thrust herself into the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall. And he smote her again. And the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a, look what it says, a narrow place. So it's gotten to the point where for, for the, this man of God, this prophet of God, and take that, and, and I want you to picture yourself trying to go down a path that God told you he didn't want you to go down, but you made in your mind, you didn't hear that, that word if, right? You heard what you wanted to hear. You want to go down this path, right? And it's a narrow path, right? Where there was no way to turn. So God's going to make it almost impossible for you to go down that path, right? And that's when you should realize, you know what? Come to your senses and like, you know what? God didn't tell me to do this. I, I should turn. I should turn back and follow the right way. And he goes, he says, and he, he said, there was no way to turn either to the right hand or to the left. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she fell down under Balaam and Balaam's anger was kindled. And he, uh, he smote the ass with the staff and the Lord opened the mouth of the ass. And she said unto Balaam, what have I done unto thee that thou hast smitten me this three times? Now, I'm not sure about you, but if the donkey starts talking to me in my <laughs> language, I'm going to fall on my face and know that that's from God. I mean, is outside of a cartoon on a television, a fictitious show, I don't think that any of us have ever heard an animal speak to us. And... But, but that Balaam don't fall on his face and repent. Balaam starts talking back to the donkey. And Balaam said unto the ass, because thou hast mocked me, I would there were a sword in my hand, for now would I kill thee. 
And the ass said unto Balaam, Am I not thine ass upon which thou hast ridden ever since I was thine unto this day? Was I ever wont to do so unto thee? The ass asked him a question. And Balaam, guess what? Balaam says, well, no. So he's reasoning with Balaam. A donkey is reasoning with this man who has decided, I'm going to go do what I want to do, no matter what God said. And he says, no, then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam and he saw something. So this is, this is like what happened is he got misdirected from the way, right? And that, that's, that's what happens is God said, do this. And Balaam in his mind wanted to do, do it this way. And so God opens his eyes where he can see now. It's like it's like the man shows you the trick where, he, where the, the, the coin disappears, right? But then he shows you how he does it. And you thought it went into that hand when really it fell into, it never left the hand that it was in. And you understand that there was misdirection, right? And he's been misdirected. He thought that this is the way that I should go. Because he didn't hear what God said. He didn't obey God's word. He says, if the men come get you. But now guess what? He's going to see this angel of the Lord standing in the way and his sword drawn. And uh, he bowed down his head and fell flat on his face. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, wherefore hast thou smitten thine ass these three times? Behold, I went out to withstand thee because, look what he says, be, this is why I was going to kill you with that sword. Because thy way is what? Perverse before me. You were doing, going the way you wanted to go. And it's, this is the message to every single believer, right? There's a certain way that God wants you to go. And there is a certain way that your flesh that your corrupt mind, that your corrupt thoughts, right, want you to go. And you have to choose, are you going to listen to God's word, which says, if, or are you going to listen to your own mind, which said, I'm going to, you know what, I'm going to rise up and go. You heard what you, how many, how many verses in the Bible have we ever shown you? that believers ignore that word right there? A lot. If you confess your sins, right? <laughs> he is. Does that mean your sins are automatically forgiven? No. No. If you confess them, they'll, he'll forgive them. But you can't ignore the ifs in the Bible. Look what Peter says about this story. He says, having eyes full of adultery. These are believers, right? They cannot cease from sin. They can't give it up beguiling unstable souls and heart they have exercised with what covetous. covetous practice you know what his problem was here guess what he might have said that he didn't want to be promoted and he didn't want very great honor and he didn't care if they filled his house with silver and gold but guess what he did care i know he cared because if he didn't care about those things, he would have went to bed. He wouldn't have rose up early. That those men would have just went their way, and he would have been fine. He said, that, "He says believers that are cursed, which have forsaken what the right way. That's what Balaam did. He forsook the right way and are gone astray, going down a path. What kind of path? Following the way of." Balaam, who loved the what? The wages of unrighteousness. He couldn't, he didn't want. He wanted that honor. He wanted that glory. He wanted that money, right? Covetousness. We talked about that last week. Covetousness is when you spend your life in the pursuit of having stuff, having money, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what most believers don't understand. There is, there is a way which seemeth right unto a man. I'm sure Balaam thought it seemed right to him, right? God said, get, get up and go, and I got up and went. That's not what God said. 
But the end, the way that we think is right, the end thereof are ways of what? Of death. A man's heart, Balaam's heart devised his what? But guess what? The Lord, look at the word, direct of his steps. He says in 1 Thessalonians 3, Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way. Now, how does he do that? Through his word. So God is trying to take us down a path. He's trying to direct our way, the way of righteousness, right? The way that he wants us to go. He says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In other words, the way you think you should go, you shouldn't lean to that. He says, if you'll acknowledge, if in all thy ways, if you acknowledge him, he shall what? Now look at that, look at that word direct. To point or aim in a what kind of line? Straight. Straight line. To point, to show the right road or course. To cause to proceed in a particular manner. To instruct. The Lord will instruct you. The Lord will direct you or make you proceed in a particular manner or go down the right road in a straight line, right? And how does he direct our paths? The word is a what? It is a light unto that path or that way that you're going down. And if you lean into your own understanding, you're going to hear what you want to hear. Balaam had already made up his mind, even when he, the Lord says if, he did not hear it. All he heard was whatever he wanted to hear. And that's what, that's what most believers do. They hear what they want to hear. They hear what they've always been taught. They hear what their pastor told them. They, they hear what they learn in seminary. And the reality is the only place that you can find truth and find a word, the word from God to lead you down a path that will not lead to destruction, right? Is going to be in the book. Now, he says, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? You know how? By taking heed according to what? Word. That's how you go down the right path. If Balaam had taken heed according to the word, he wouldn't have went down the wrong path it he got to the point god showed mercy to him how many of us if god opened our eyes and we're trying to go down a path has an angel with a sword ready to take our lives how many people maybe in a, even in our own life that we've known in our life that because they wanted to go down a path that the lord didn't want them to go down and they were going to go down it no matter what there was an angel there waiting for them and God probably kept giving them, he probably kept giving them signs. Don't go down this path. Don't go. He'd put blocks and blockades in front of them, but they, they keep going around the blockades, right? It's kind of like a man driving down a road and there's, there, the road has been, because uh, there's a flood came through and the road is washed out, right? And so they take, they take their car, their motorcycle around the, and they, they keep going down and they end up what? Killing themselves because they wouldn't take heed to the sign. So God wants to direct your path. Now, a magician, and Satan is the great magician, right? It's not magic. It's called misdirection. Look what misdirection is. This is what Satan wants to do, to give a wrong what? Direction, as to misdirect a passenger, to, to, to direct to a wrong person or place, right? So, so, Satan isn't, don't get me wrong, there's, you know, there's the, the false prophet will be able to do miracles and stuff in the last day, but that's not Satan's tool. It's not him doing all these great miracles and everything. Satan only wants to misdirect you, right? He wants you to be looking to the left when you should be looking to the what? Right. That's what a magician does. When he puts that coin into his hand, this hand, and he doesn't really put it in that hand, he keeps it in the right hand, you think it's in the left hand, you think that it disappeared. All he's doing is getting your focus over on the left side and not on the right side, right? right. Look what he says here. He says, 
that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the what? The slight of men. Now look at that word slight. It is an artful trick, right? It, it is a trick or feat so dexterously performed that the manner of performance escapes observation, just like this. What does a magician do? It's called sleight of hand, right? So it escapes. It's not magic. The coin didn't disappear. But because it was done so immaculate, he practiced it so many times that you just didn't see that he dropped it in his right hand and you thought he put it in his left hand. It just escaped your observation. Look what he says. Don't be carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men. It shouldn't, when men do things, when men teach certain doctrines, teach lies or tell you that, you know, uh, you should tithe, you know, no matter what you got. And if, if you tithe this much, God will bless you and he'll make you wealthy and all. That's them wanting you to look at what they're saying, right? Look to the left while on the right, God's word says, uh, those men that say gain is God on this, withdraw yourself from them. So don't let men come along and play an artful trick that's going to escape your observation. He says they do it with the slight of men and cunning craftiness, and they're doing it for a purpose. They lie in wait to what? Deceive. deceive. And is that not what a magician's doing? Yes. He is deceiving your mind and your eyes. You think that thing disappeared. Look at this. It says a well-performed slight right? We know what slide is. It's a trick which is which escapes observation. If it's a well-performed slide, looks like, look now listen, it looks like an ordinary, natural, and completely innocent gesture. It just escapes your eyes. You just don't see it. Changed in hand position or body posture, in addition to manual dexterity, sleight of hand in close-up magic depends on the use of psychology, timing, and guess what? And natural choreography in accomplishing a magical effect. It's not really magic. It just, but it looks like this completely and totally innocent thing, right? Wow. It's amazing. Even as a, you know, as a child, it's easy. You do these little tricks and children don't get it. But then you got grown adults are going to these magic shows and they're watching these big men and they're literally thinking that they're doing magic when the reality is all misdirection. It's all sleight of hand. And that's what the scripture is going to say. Then if any man shall say unto you, lo, Look over here to the left. Guess what? Here's Christ. Or, or look over here, there, right? What are they doing? Misdirecting. They're misdirecting you. Look what, look what Jesus says. Don't believe it. He said, that's not, that's not, that's not it. That's not Christ. For there shall rise false Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders. When you see that magical trick, you're going to think, man, this guy is, wow, he's got these powers and magic. No, he doesn't. He says, in so much that if it were possible, they shall what? Deceive. What's, that's what misdirection is, right? Right. It is to deceive. He says, behold, I, the Lord, have told you what before. That's what they're going to do. They're going to get you looking one way. If you spend too much time on the television watching the news, you know what that's for? It's to misdirect your mind, misdirect your eyes. Because if you knew the scripture, you'd read. If you know the scripture, you know what's going on in the world. Right. But if you listen to the news, guess what you're going to think? <laughs> Something else is going on. Right. You have to be careful. He says, he says, behold, he is in the desert. Look over here. He's over here. 
Behold, he is in the secret chambers. Don't believe it. For as the lightning cometh out of the east, that's the word of God telling you. This is how you're going to know. If a man's telling you he's over here, he's trying to misdirect you. He's trying to deceive you. That's, that's who Satan is. Look what it says here. The serpent was more subtle, sly, artful, cunning, planned by, as a plan. He had a plan, right? Mm -hmm. Look at the word, deceitful. He is the great magician. He's, he, look what he's going to do here. Um, after, after he tricks Eve, the Lord's going to come to Eve, and look what it says. The Lord God said unto the woman, what is this thou hast done? And the woman said, this, oh, this magician came up, and he what? He beguiled me. He deceived me, right? By amusement, right? That's, that's what he's doing. He's taking your, your eyes and your mind, and he's pointing it over here. He said, it says to elude anything disagreeable by amusement. Look at that word elude. To escape, to evade. Remember the, the cartoon Roadrunner? Coyote? Oh, yeah. Wiley. What's his name? Wiley Coyote. The entire thing that Wiley Coyote was trying to do was to trap, to catch the Roadrunner. That's what that's what he is. He says to elude by amusement, to wiles, to escape being what? Seen. When you go back up here, look at that. Escapes observation, right? right. That's what he says, elude, to escape being what? Seen. Seen. That's the definition of beguile. He's trying to beguile the woman. He did beguile the woman, right? Right. And I'm going to show you how he did it, because that's what God said. He said, don't let the left hand know what the right hand's doing. So when you tithe with your right hand, guess what? Don't let the, don't, because it's, it's sleight of hand. If you let this side of your mind know this side of your mind is doing something, right? right. Then you're going to do it to deceive people. You're going to want people to think, I'm giving. So what's your left hand do? You let everybody know you're giving, right? So they'll come up to you and tell you what a good person, a holy person. That's why he don't want you to let the left hand know what the right hand is doing. That's why he don't, when you fast, he doesn't want you to disfigure yourself. When you pray, he wants you to do it in a closet. Because then you begin to do it for the wrong reason. You want to be, you want people to, to see something that's really not true. You want people to think that you're actually this holy, righteous person because you're doing all these good deeds when the reality is, guess what? You're, you're deceiving people. You're beguiling people. You're, you're um, using slight of hand. You want people to say, oh, see, I'm giving, I'm giving, I'm giving. When on the, over here on this side, you know what you're really doing? You're sinning. <laughs> yeah. You're doing all these evil things. You want people to see this person and not this person. That's what sleight of hand is. A lot of these men, these men that get up there and they're supposedly these big preachers and they got these big churches and they got lots of money and everything. You know what they do when they get up on that stage? They're performing. They're beguiling you. They're using sleight of hand. They're, they, you, you're dressed up really nice. You got a coat and a tie on and, and all these things. And hey, hey, gain is godliness, right? But behind the scenes, guess what they're doing? They're unstable. They're sinning. They're all their life. They're corrupt. Okay. He says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the what? The wiles. Now look what the wild, a wild is. It's a trick. It's not real magic. It's a strategy for, for a purpose. Why did Wiley County, what was it? Every episode was about him laying traps, right? To catch the roadrunner. This is who the devil is. We should not be ignorant of his devices. He's going to lay tricks. He's going to have strategy. He didn't go to Eve without a plan. 
He had a plan to entrap her, to ensnare her, to deceive her. And that's what we have to understand. That's why it says, you know, if they say, oh, Christ is in the desert. Believe it not. I told you before. Don't believe it. How are you going to know then? You got to know the word. The word says, Balaam, if you go, if they come and get you, you go with them. The word didn't say get up and go with them. It said, if they come, you can go with them. Yeah. So we need we need help from the Lord here because we all we we the heart is deceitfully wicked. We all have fleshly, earthly desires, right? And the Bible just wants us to be content. Because this 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 world that we live in, it's evil. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, that's a good thing, isn't it? So that's a good he desire for good work. Mm -hmm. But a bishop then must be blameless. And what, what does it mean to be blameless? It means to be the husband of one wife. It means to be vigilant. You better be vigilant because the devil is what? He's running around, right? He's a he's a he's a devouring lion. He wants to devour you. You need to be sober. You need to be of good behavior. You need to be given to hospitality. You need to be apt to teach. Those that's what blameless means. If you want to be a bishop, you need to be those things. If you want to be a bishop, you should not be given to wine. You shouldn't be somebody that hits people. If you strike your wife, you don't need to be a bishop. You shouldn't be greedy of money, but you should be patient, not a brawler, not what? Covetous. Covetous. If your life is to pursue riches, you don't need to be a bishop. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Now, now, this is important. A bishop does not need to be a novice. And it's one of the things I've seen in the Philippines that um, I know the, uh, part of the problem is you can't find a lot of older men to do it. But you have to start. But a novice isn't just, I think, a young believer. Let's look at that word novice. It means new. One who is new, right? A beginner. One newly planted in the church or one newly converted. Now, why is it so important? Because in modern Christianity, you know what a body of believers will do? They'll go to a seminary. They'll find somebody who has a degree and they will bring them into the church and they know nothing about them. They don't know nothing about their life. They don't know nothing. All they know is they got a degree and they supposedly know the word of God, right? Right. And when you pull somebody who is either young in the faith, a young person in general, right, or someone that you've never been around, he says, a bishop should not be a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, something's going to happen to him. He's going to fall into a trap. Moreover, he must have a good, a good report of them which are without. So there's some qualifications for him coming in there. One is he can't be beginner. He can't be new to the people. He has to have been proven that, that he's a good godly man, right? And that he cares about the truth. Lest that man fall into, right? Look at those words. Reproach and what? That's what a snare is. An instrument for catching animals, right? He says it consists of a cord or string with slip knots in which the leg is entangled. Anything by which one is entangled, it's a trap. And that's what the devil does. He says, look over here, look away from the word of God, right? And look over here toward the earth and toward the worldly thing and toward your lust and toward your desires. And guess what? Guess what happened to Balaam? It's the same thing will happen to you. If you try to go in, because there, there's going to be a way that seem a fright unto a man. Now I'm talking. I'm not talking to unbelievers. I'm talking to believers. There's going to be a way that you think is the right way. Oh, oh! If I get rich and I can help all the poor people, 
Well, you don't understand the deceitfulness of riches. You think when you get rich, but you spend all your time getting rich, guess what you're being? Covetous. And guess what? The covetous shall not inherit the kingdom. So you have to be very, very I'm not saying the Lord won't bless you. Do seek ye first the what? Kingdom. And all these things shall be added unto you. You don't have to be covetous. He'll take care of you. Right. He says, and the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness. Now what he says, this is what we're supposed to be doing. John, this is what we're supposed to be doing. Instructing those that oppose themselves. How are they opposing themselves? They're trying to go down a path that they're not supposed to be going down. So we're supposed to instruct them and tell them, I, I know you're trying to get rich and I know you're just trying to take care of your family and everything. And that's good that you're trying to take, but, but be, be content. Feed your family and take care of yourself. The Lord will bless you. Go down this path. Guess what? But they are opposing themselves. That's what Balaam was doing. He says, if God peradventure <coughs> will give them repentance unto the acknowledging of the truth. That's why we're instructing them that God will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth and that they may recover themselves out of the what? Who are taken captive, right? They're entangled. They're ensnared by the devil because they thought this is the path they should go down. They're so concerned about the world, worldly goods because what did the devil do? He used sleight of hand. That believer over there that you allow to stay in there, that's, he, he's going around telling, you know what, we got this program over here that you can, you can get rich easy. You can, you know, get rich themes, right? You go over here and if you'll do this and you, I'll, get, I'll set you up and you can sell this and you can do this and make all this money, right? You know what he's doing? He's taking them down the way of Balaam. And that's what the devil, and then, and then when you're going down that path, right? We've all seen it. You know, if you've ever seen a rabbit trap, it's a little tiny box. The rabbit can fit in. He goes in and he eats the carrot and the, the, the door falls down. But we also see these. You see, like, they'll dig a big old hole, right? And they'll cover it with straw and something really light. And, and then they'll put food on top of it. And then when you walk on top of it, guess what it does? You fall down into a ditch, right? Into a hole, right? You're entrapped. You're ensnared. And that's that's what the devil does, right? Mm -hmm. He sets a trap that you're going to what? Fall into. You're going to fall into that snare because you're going down the wrong path. God is not going to lead you. Is God going to lead you down to down a path that's going to hurt you? No. The path is a path of righteousness, a path of holiness, a path of contentment, a path of believing that God is not unrighteous to forget when you do what's right and help people. That's the path we want to go down. We're not trying to get wealthy. We're not trying. We're not trying to have lots of nice things in this world. It's all right if God gives it to you, as long as you keep it flowing in and out, right? right. But if any believer, any man, teach otherwise, what, what's he mean otherwise? Well, this doctrine right here, the doctrine which is according to what? God is. So if a man comes along in, and he's among you, right, and he's teaching these things, and he's instructing them, to oppose themselves, where you're instructing those that oppose themselves not to do that, this man's going to come in. Guess what? If any man teach otherwise, you know what it says about those those believers? He's proud, and guess what he knows? He don't know nothing about the way of the Lord. If the Lord, if the way to be holy and righteousness was through riches, then Jesus Christ was a deceived man. Because he left the throne of God and he had nothing. He had not a place to lay his head. And we are told to follow after what? His path, right. his way in this world. Don't get me wrong. After he suffered and he died, and he, he, he's going to sit 
He's going to, he's sitting on a throne and he is in glory now. And when he appears, if you will take the same path as him, guess what? You shall appear with him in glory. You will have glory. But if any man teach otherwise, you, I'm going to tell you that believer, he doesn't know anything. He may, he may have a church with a hundred thousand people in it, but God who does not lie says he knows nothing about the right path. Right. He says he's dotting about with questions and strife of words where have cometh envy. These things, these men who teach otherwise, this is what it causes in the church. Envy, strife, railings, evil surmising, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute. Of, there is no truth in them. They don't know nothing because they suppose that what? Gain is godliness. It's not. Money has nothing to do with godliness. Right. Withdraw yourself. But godliness with contentment is, guess what? Great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can take nothing out. I'd rather go into my grave owning nothing and knowing that God one day is not unrighteous to forget, right? right. He's going to look at all those things that I forsook and he's going to pay me back. Right. So my conclusion is having food and clothing, raiment, right? Yes. Let us be content. But there are always those believers. But they... That will be rich, they that teach men otherwise, right? They that oppose himself, they that think covetousness is all right, they that think pursuing after riches their whole life, and that's 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 godliness. They that will be rich fall into a snare of the devil. They fall into a trap, temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts. Which do what? Drown men. drown men. They fall into a trap that is going to drown them, right? Yes. Well, we should be, we should be, these men are teaching. Otherwise, you know what you're supposed to be teaching? John, if, you, you, if you'll teach this to, for the rest of your life, if I don't care if you teach it every single week, then I believe that when the Lord appears, he's going to say, well done, good, good and faithful son, uh, good and faithful servant teaching us that's what we should be teaching that denying ungodliness in other words living our life according to the doctrine which is according to godliness denying ungodliness and denying worldly lust that we should live soberly righteously and godly in this present evil world that we live in right don't be teaching men anything otherwise other than that that's what we should be teaching men. We covetous and hanging around with people like this that think gain is God in us, we're going to fall into a trap, a snare. That drown, or that's, it's going to drown you. You're going to wake up one day, your life's going to be over, and you're like, what did I do with it? Because you can't take nothing. It's certain. So Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou bid me come unto thee on the wet water. And he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water. He's walking toward the Lord. He's walking to who is Jesus. He's the word, right? His eyes are focused on the word. But guess what sleight of hand is? Oh, look over here to the left. Right, take your eyes off the Lord, right? What begins to happen? So, so he walked on the water to go to Jesus. He had his eyes straight, right? Like he's supposed to. Straight as the gate, narrows the way, right? But when he saw, sleight of hand, he's, he takes his eyes off of it. The wind was boisterous. So he starts kind of glancing over to the left, right? And over to the right. And he was afraid and he began to what? That's what happens when you put your eyes on the world. That's what the devil wants. You're not what we're not worried about the world. Oh, come on. I tell you what. 
Let's go to the ball game. Let's go to the concert. Let's go to the amusement park. Let's go do this. Let's go do that, right? Let's go make lots of money. You know what you're doing? You're going for a trick of the devil. He's a great magician. He wants you, your attention and your eyes to be over here on the world. He says, love not the world, right? Nor, neither the things that are in the world. Where is your focus? Where is your attention, right? right. Noah built the ark. You think Noah went in? If You think Noah was one of these, let's go put, prop up my feet and watch television all day, right? No. Noah went about doing what he was supposed to do every single day until that ark was ready and finished. When he saw the wind, took his eyes off the Lord, right? He was afraid and began to sink. And this is what I'm going to tell you. When you begin to take your eyes off the Lord and you begin to sink, you need to say the same thing that Peter said. Lord, save me. Are you drowning in the world? Are you, is your heart set on having worldly things, worldly lusts, money, goods, riches? If, if, if you have food and clothes, be content, right? Don't hang around people who are going to take your eyes off they're going to use sleight of hand, right? If a man is standing up there in a pulpit and he's telling you, oh, you know, look at me. I'm godly because I have all this stuff. God wouldn't bless me, right? Let me tell you, that man is destitute of the truth. He doesn't know anything. And you need to, right here, withdraw yourself from him because he's going down the wrong path. And guess what? Many shall follow his what pernicious ways. Right. You don't want to follow his way because if a man walks off a cliff and there's a, a people following him and they're not paying attention, you know they're going to walk off the cliff too. Right. You you have a mind. God has given you His word. Don't pay attention to that sleight of hand. If the book says if the men come and get you, you know what you should do. You should lay down and get you a good night's sleep because if the Lord really wants them in to wake you up, guess what? Wake They'll up. wake you up. Enjoy your rest. But if you've already made your mind in going this way and saying, I don't believe this, I don't believe the Lord will punish believers, you've already been deceived. He says, take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting. That's overeating, drunkenness, and cares of this life. Where is your mind? Where's your eyes? Where's your heart? You're looking over here. You're concerned about food. You're concerned about, how am I going to do this? How am I going to pay this bill? How am I going to buy my, I'm, where's my food going to come from? I got to work. I got to have money. That's all you're concerned about. Guess what? then that's sleight of hand. The devil wants you to care about those things. Right. Where God says, take no thought, right? right? But you're worried about those things. That's, that's the devil using sleight of hand to take your eyes off the word. When you wake up every day, what's the first thing that you do? Do you talk to the Lord? Do you ask him, Lord, I want you to hear me. I want to hear your voice. I want, I want, I want to read your word. I want you to direct my path. I don't want to lean to my own understanding. He says, the way he says, if your hearts become concerned about overeating and drunkenness and cares of this life, so that that day come upon you, look at the word, unawares. You know what sleight of hand is? It escapes observation. That's why when the Lord cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. You know why? Because the devil has deceived every single believer into looking over here at the left hand, right? And there's nothing in it. The coin's over here. It never changed hands. And so the word of God, you have to keep your eyes on the word of God. You cannot, if you want the Lord to come back, and not to escape your observation, right? right? You cannot allow someone to come along 
and you slide a hand and say, you know what? But look at all this. Look, look, look at the tree. It's 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 good for food, pleasant to the eyes, one to make one wise, right? Isn't that what the devil does? He says, the lust of the flesh, the lust of eyes, the pride of life, those things are not of the Father. He says, these are they which are among the thorns. This is the weeds, such as hear the word, and guess what? The cares of the world and the what? what, what what's that? You, you want to be rich. Understand. <coughs> You're deceiving your own heart sometimes when you think that you can have riches. Oh, if I get rich, then I'll help everybody. If you're not helping everybody when you're poor, if you're not trying to help people and give to people and take care of people when you're poor, you're not going to do it when you're rich. Amen. You better make up your mind now, no matter if the Lord blesses me, great. If the Lord doesn't bless me, I'm still, when I see someone in need, I want to help them. You've been caught up as a believer. You're caught up in the weeds, right? The lust, the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, the lust of other things. Those things are the sleight of hand of the devil that you will fall into his snare. Right. And what does God say? The same, remember what, remember what um, when Peter fell into it, he took his eyes off the Lord. He said, Lord, save me. If you as a believer have been going down the wrong path, I want you to hear what David says. Deliver me out of the mire. Let me not sink. Let me be, deli be delivered from them that hate me and out of the deep waters. Let not the water flood overflow me. Neither let the deep swallow me up. Let not the pit shut her mouth upon me. Save me, O Lord, Peter. Hear me, O Lord, David, for thy loving kindness is good. Turn unto me according to the multitude of thy tender mercies and hide not thy face from thy servant. Mm -hmm. So when you're in trouble, when you're sinking, just like Peter, just like David, you've taken the wrong path, cry out to the Lord. Apollo, say, I'm sorry, Lord, I went down the wrong path. Um, you know, I, I played Balaam. I didn't hear you say if. Hear me speedily, O Lord. He says, for when they speak great swelling words, because they're coming, they're going to tell you, right? They're going to tell you whatever you want to hear. They're going to allure. We talked about this word before. It's just like, what's, what's allure? It's a fish hook. It's a trap, right? right? They allure through the lust. And that's one thing that we don't want to do, Right. Because you don't want the weeds. You don't want the lust. You don't want the deceitfulness of riches. They allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness. Those, now look, these are believers. Those, they're alluring those believers. Those that were clean lot. They were entangled. They escaped the trap of the devil. They're on the right path. They escaped from the them who live in error. Who lives in error? Those people that think that covetousness, that, that gain is godliness. We escape from them, right? Because right. they promise them liberty. They themselves, those they're the servants of corruption because they think gain is godliness. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. He says, for if after they have escaped that trap, after that, and what's the trap? the pollutions of the world, right? The lust of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the things of the world, right? right? After you've escaped that and you're not worried about the money, you're not worried about these things, guess what? How do you, first of all, how did you escape? You escaped the pollutions of the world through what? The knowledge, the knowledge of the Lord. But if after you escape, then you get entangled, they are again what? Entangled. So you, you as a believer, you were going down the wrong path. The Lord saves you. His, you escape from the pollutions of the world, but then you get trapped back up in it again and overcome. He says the latter end is worse than them from the beginning, for it had been better for them not to have went, known the way of righteousness. 
You know what the way of righteousness that he's talking about? It is the doctrine which is according to godliness. And if any man teach otherwise, he doesn't know anything. He's destitute of the truth. He thinks gain is godless. He says, withdraw thyself from him. Right. He says, it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from it, the holy commandment. Don't. Once you get on the right path, don't go back to the world. You can't go back to Egypt, right? You don't want to die in the wilderness and you don't want to go back to Egypt. You want to make it into the land of Canaan. Don't murmur against the Lord. Don't complain against the Lord. Understand that every single thing in this life, good and bad that happened to you, all things work for what? For good. good. All things, good and evil, you have to embrace that, that every time you go through a trial, guess what God's trying to do? Teach he's teaching you. He's changing you. He's making you like him so that when you get to that inheritance, when you stand at the judgment seat, he, you get to inherit the kingdom. All believers will not get the inheritance. They will not. Listen to me. They will not. All of Israel that came out of Egypt, that were saved out of Egypt, went through the wilderness. Right. Joshua and Caleb got to enter in. Right. <clears throat> he says, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ have made us what? Free. We're not tangled. We've escaped. And be not entangled again with the yoke of what? Bondage. The world is bondage. Just like Egypt was bondage. The world is bondage, right? If you have escaped the pollutions of the world, don't go back. Put your eyes on the kingdom. Don't let some man, you slide a hand to get you to look to the right or look to the left, right? The word is a lamp unto your feet so you don't stumble. He says, Christ who gave himself for our sins that he might, look what it says, deliver us from this present evil world because this present evil world is run by the god of this world who is the master magi magician who uses sleight of hands to trap you and ensnare you with deceit and lies and the only way that you can escape that is you have to know the word of god you've got to make a choice do you want out of the world do you want out of egypt or are you content living with lust are you you want to pursue after if if you're my friend but you won't give up covetousness i have to separate from you i love you but i have to do it he says by faith moses moses had to make a choice didn't he right. when he was come to years he refused to be called the son of pharaoh's daughter every believer has to make a choice whether to suffer with the people of God, or to what? Enjoy the pleasures of sin. But it's only for one lifetime. And he's esteemed the reproach of Christ greater riches than the, all the treasures in Egypt because he had respect into the fact that God will pay you back, that he is not unrighteous to forget, that he is a reward of those that diligently seek him, right? Yes. So I'm going to close with this. Understand magic is really all it is is it's an illusion god, he's, god says he's going to send some strong delusions in the end of the world right so when he says somebody says christ is over here believe it not he's told you beforehand right, right. he's told you in the scripture beware of covetousness beware of fornication don't look to the left don't look to the right. Keep your eyes on him. Keep your eyes on the word and you will not fall into the trap. And I'll close with this. I put this on here. I, I, I just wanted y'all to see this magic. Y'all have heard of that word, right? Right. You know what that word means? It is the name of a deity worshipped by the Syrians. They use, people have always used sleight of hand. Every time you get to a church, guess what a pastor's doing? He's telling you this over here, 
and it's contrary to the word of God. So what's he trying to do? He's trying to make you not look at the word of God, but to believe what he's telling you. And it's always for an impure motive. All right.